What happens when my beloved G Max meets the Sigma R17? And they go on a date, they have some meals together, and then they fall in love. The result is this the Formbot T Rex 2 Plus. Well, and this is my review ish, sort of. I'm Joel. This is 3D Printing Nerd. You don't wear glasses. You're lucky, Sean. And awesome. You're lucky and awesome. You're, you're awesome. I've had this machine for quite a while. I'm gonna be honest to you, and the reason I'm calling it a review-ish is because it's an ish. I didn't experiment with materials on this machine, and I, I didn't do a standard set of prints. I just printed big. I mean, I did some small things, I did some configuration, but I just printed big because I figured, that's what people do with these machines, they print big. I mean, I print small, I print some small things, but I print big, I just printed big, that's what I did. Oh, specs on the machine, I brought up my laptop because I was having a problem remembering things. <clears throat> The T-Rex 2 Plus is a large format multifunctional 3D printer. It has a build area of 400 on the X, 400 on the Y, and 500 millimeters on the Z. It's got independent dual extruders, which you've seen before on a couple different machines. It's got industrial linear guides on either side of the gantry columns. It has TBI ball screws, which I guess are good. I'm not a ball screw expert. It says it has quick replaceable hot ends, UBL auto bed leveling, extruder wiping system, a customized print bed, dual zone heating plates, which are optional, high temperature extruders, which are optional, and a laser engraver, which is also optional. Those are the top features listed on the Formbot site. Let's just go over those. All right, 400 on the X, 400 on the Y, and 500 on the Z, which essentially is a match to the G-Max 1.5 XT Plus build area. It's already borrowed heavy from the design, so why not include the, the similar build area? It has independent dual extruders. So once I move these Christmas trees, you can kind of see that these, hello, these can move either side. Dual extrusion is a wonderful thing when done right, and the independent dual extruder system, I believe, is better than the Ultimaker's lifting nozzle trick. I also think it's better than the side-by-side. -side. I'm really liking the way Prusa is doing it through the single nozzle, but if you don't have that, dual independent extruders, I think, is the way to go for dual extrusion. Industrial linear guides, it shouts from the web page. Originally, when I viewed the web page, I thought these were linear rails. I was like, ooh, linear rails, that's a really good idea, but they are not linear rails. These are guides. So it's got little metal wheels on either side that grab the guides and, and assist it in staying in one spot as it goes up and down. Staying in one spot and going up and down doesn't make sense unless I say it. So there you go. I'm gonna be honest, when I found out it wasn't linear, Rails, I was a wee bit disappointed. Just a wee bit disappointed. The Z or Z axis, rather than it being a teensy little lead screw, are these two giant ball screws. And ball screws uh, allow, I believe, a much finer range of detail as far as the movement in them, I think. Again, I'm not a ball screw expert, but I believe having ball screws is better than having lead screws. A quick replaceable hot end so I don't believe that's the case. I mean, sorry tree. These are the hot ends they give you and there's various nozzle sizes and one hardened nozzle that they give you, which then get replaced up in here. But it's not, it's not just plug and play. I mean, if you, here, let's take one out of the bag. It's a hardened nozzle on this one and it's a heater block. So the heater block still needs a core and it needs a thermistor. The core is uh, already in here and you just have to loosen a set screw to pull it out, but the thermistor is really fragile wire usually. And I know if I'm to, uns to unscrew it, I would break it. So I did not try any of these other nozzles, but it's a big printer. I know I've used multiple nozzles on many other machines and the settings are defined by the slicer. So it's, if you, if you find yourself with delicate fingers and you're, able to add the heater core and the thermistor and you're not worried about breaking something then by all means use these i did not Ah, uh, next feature is the ubl auto bed leveling system and uh on the sd card there's something called ubl.g code that comes with it and you select it 
and it uses the left hot end and it goes through and it probes 225 different points on the bed over 20 some odd minutes. And then at the end of that G code is an M500, I think? 500 or 501, one of those writes it to the memory and it does that, that's what it does. And then you're good to go. I didn't have any problems with that, with that, but well, more later. It calls out an extruder wiping system. So in each of the purge buckets, you have uh, a metal brush that the nozzle can scrape against. And so uh, once, once extruder one docks to bring extruder two over or vice versa, the nozzle has to pass over this metal brush and that can wipe away any of the bits of filament that are left on it. It's very similar to how the Sigma does it with a NinjaFlex wiping uh, blade in the purge bucket. These happen to use a, a wire bristle brush. Next up is the customized print bed. And when I got this, I was given the heated build plate and I was given the non-heated build plate, uh, but the, the heated build plate was attached. So that's what I used. It was really confusing. I got it working. The problem is when they give you this, they give you a roll of masking tape that's that wide and they give you a roll of captain tape, which is that wide. So if you're going to apply tape liberally to the print bed, you've got multiple rows or multiple columns of tape that you have to put on. It's beyond annoying and there's better ways to do this. I actually had a 16 by 16 inch piece of build tack that I put on here. That's what I used for the, the longest time, just in the last few days. I actually put on this Gecko Tech Easy Stick Hot Sheet and that was working just as well but it's 2018. There's no excuse for a large printer to not have some sort of removable build plate or awesome build surface. It's just not, it's just not there. I mean, they could have pre-installed it with their own little version of build tech or they could have pre-taped it or something, but they didn't. It's just metal when it comes to you and it's, it's up to you. Well, this is the high temp extruder that you, that you get. And uh, essentially, if you were to mount it, you, you just have to, you have to take this off and then you have to put it on. I don't know, I, I didn't need to print peak. I didn't need to print anything high temperature on this. Uh, this is an optional accessory and uh, I'm choosing not to review this machine with this optional accessory. Finally, in this bag right here is the laser engraver. Uh, it, it comes with these really awesome green shades to keep you safe. Uh, I, I chose also not to use the laser engraver. And uh, I'm not reviewing a laser engraving machine. I'm reviewing a 3D printer. This is an optional accessory that people pay extra for. And I did not use this because I'm in a room with low ceilings. It's not the best ventilation. Uh, I don't wanna burn stuff with a laser in here. It could set off the sprinkler system. It could blind me if I wasn't wearing the glasses. It's just this, this wasn't of interest to me. They sent it along. I didn't review it. Oh my goodness. So the website does say the T-Rex 2 Plus comes assembled nearly, comma, only takes 10 to 15 minutes to complete assembly. Very easy to operate. Uh, I, I assembled this back when it was in the garage and it did take me longer than 10 to 15 minutes. The gantry itself, it's packed well. The gantry is on its side. And once you get everything out, you have to put in screws and brackets on either side. The assembly of this machine is standard when compared with other i3 style large format 3D printers. So any CR10 you get, the FormBot, that's how, you, that's how you assemble them. They ship with the gantry down to lower the size of the shipping container or box or whatever it comes in. And then they give it to you and you put it together. It wasn't hard to put together. I connected up the little jibblies in the back and it worked. So if I can do it, you can do it. <laughs> so to talk a little further about the machine, let's start at the bottom. The bottom of this machine has four rubber feet that keep it in place and reduce vibrations while it's printing. They're useful, I like it. The extrusions, I believe they're what, 40, 40? They're huge. These are huge, heavy, metal extrusions. And I think that's a value right there. Again, these are linear guides. The LCD screen is up there with a the little knob and then cables go back to this box right here. This is where you insert the SD card. This is where you attach USB if you need to do a firmware update. 
This is also where this extraordinary self-made ribbon cable exists between the power supply and the box. It's glorious. I will show you. And at the top you get, oh, it's a light and the spool holders. Let's talk about the light first. Through the box, you've got LED on and LED off. There we go. That light, I'm gonna be honest, super handy because this was tucked away originally in the corner of a garage. Not a lot of light over it. I hit that, turned it on, and it worked great. Plus that light when you're filming a time-lapse, incredibly valuable and it works well. Now for the spool holders. These things suck. You didn't see that coming? The reason being is because it requires you to use tools to adjust the width uh, that they take up. And so depending on the spool size that you put on, you're gonna have to go find a tool and adjust it and move it and then tighten it. And the little, little lock nuts that go in the grooves of the extrusions, whatever they're called, T-nuts, I think, uh, sometimes they get out of alignment and then they pop off and then you have to put it back on. So here's what happened. Someone sent me these for a fan mail Friday and these are awesome. So you put the ends on and then there we go. And now look at that. You've got a fantastic spool holder that's easy to take apart, add a spool to, put back and put on the machine. And at this point, you're limited by whatever size PVC you're gonna buy for the middle of the spool holder. I have two. I'm not gonna put that one on. Well, I've told you about the machine. I guess it's time to talk about the prints. First, I'm gonna show you this Moon City because this is glorious. This was printed in PLA and it's a fantastic print. I believe it was printed at 0.3 layers and I think it looks wonderful. It took a long time, but you know what? Good things do take time. I think the T-Rex 2 Plus did a great job, especially on the overhang right here. There is, it's, it's perfect. There's no indication that it had any issues with the overhang. I, I love this model too. I just look at this and I'm like, oh, that's nice. Well, I also printed some of the Luby 3D uh, squizzles. These were fun. Uh, I printed this in the Strong Hero uh, Splendid filament. And it looks, it looks okay. And, and this looks okay. I think I had a little bit of over extrusion that, and that's visible in the head area. But I think it was specific to this because I printed with this, this blue filament. I forget which one it is. They're both PLAs and it turned out better. I like the squizzles and Luby 3D did a fantastic job with these. I love this model. It's Omnom. Look at that. That is Omnom modeled by Sparky Face 5. It's glorious. It was printed in the Strong Hero 3D Splendid as well. I love the model. Uh, a little bit of layer zitting, but that's just from the settings. Uh, I think my, my layers were good. Uh, the, the problem with the Splendid filament is that it's, it's got different colors of pigment along the way and those different colored pigments, pigments cause the filament to have slightly different settings. And so even though it was great down here in the purples, it was a little over extruded in the yellows. And that's just something that you do. And just a little though, just a little. Cause when you're printing this large, it's just, it's just awesome. And this, this model turned out great. I'm extremely happy with this. Oh man, you remember this? I printed the giant ghosty. <laughs> I printed this to prove that the dual extrusion was working great on the form bot and it did a fantastic job. The tongue in a red PLA, the rest of this in a white PLA. I put a video out on the channel. It worked well. It has a pause, but there's no way to swap out the filaments easily. I thought with something this large, if you're running one kilogram spools or 500 gram spools, then you're going to need to change the filaments. It would be great if their firmware actually had a way to, hey, you know what, change filament. It would park the head. It would retract the old filament so you could put the new filament in. I don't know, just an idea. This still turned out great. The video on this was a lot of fun. Hopefully uh, my editor, Sean, is showing you some cool shots from that video because he's awesome, just like this. This is awesome. Oh, and look at that. It's my dual color octopus. I love this. Again, some extrusion issues, which I could have solved had I spent hours trying to find the right extrusion settings for the PLA. But regardless of that, I think this, this still turned out wonderful. 
my dual settings were a little bit off for that. And uh, well, here, I can, I can tell you why. <laughs> Configuring the dual extrusion setup on this machine is done through G code and they give you a print that's set for dual extrusion. And then you print it out and then you look at the offsets of the inner square from the outer square and using calipers, you measure the distance in X and in Y that it is off. You then plug those values into the G code and then you run this again, hoping to get one that is perfect. And um, that one is not good. And then I measured and then that one was better. So it does work. It's not automatic. It's not easy. It's completely doable by someone who is technically minded and not afraid of opening up a G code file in a text editor. Also, when referring to dual extrusion, it's it's kind of weird. So you get these profiles that they, they send to you. The SD card has profiles for Simplify 3D and for an ancient version of Cura. I used Simplify 3D. Uh, they give you a profile for the left extruder and they give you a profile for the right extruder. So in Simplify 3D, if you load a dual extrusion model, you have to then assign each of the different processes to the different profiles for the extruder. It's, it's, a little, it's a little backwards and you can't take advantage of some of the stuff that Simplify 3D offers as far as creating skirts around the model using both extruders to prime them. So you run into problems because while the left extruder goes through, wipes itself and does the skirt around the model, the right extruder never primes itself, doesn't purge itself, and just tries to start printing. And that's why I ended up with problems, well, problems like this. So all of the tentacles look great except that one. And that's where printing would just fail. It would attempt to print the blue and then it would go to print the white. It wouldn't spit out filament from the second one straight away because it was never primed. And that was an issue. And that's why I didn't do a lot of dual extrusion printing on this machine. It does have duplicate mode for dual extrusion. Again, it's a Simplify 3D profile where you, it cuts the size of the bed in half on the X axis in your slicer. And then in Simplify 3D, you do the adjustments, you spit out the G code, and then you open the G code in a text editor and add a specific G code command, which then tells the brain to duplicate the model on this extruder. I did my maker coin as a duplicate print and I thought it turned out decent. And I did have to, once this one came out, I pushed down on the lever and pushed the filament down to get it started because it didn't prime it. So what I did is I tried a larger duplicate model. And if you look at that, it's nearly the size of the X when dealing in duplicate mode. And the white turned out great. The red looks, well, the red had a failure on one of the, on one of the arms of the tree. Unfortunately, I think the bed is warped in a way. When doing duplicate printing, uh, you have to manually level the bed because it doesn't use auto bed leveling. And the problem is if when you're doing this calibration, if the second extruder is off from the first extruder, if, if left is lower or higher than right, then if your bed isn't going to be level across, you, you can end up with problems. I think that's what happened here. I think that on the edge of the bed, it's just slightly bowed down. And I think that's what happened with this tree. It worked. It just had a problem with the bed leveling. Where do we stand with this machine? I mean, it's, it's a formidable machine. It, it, it calls from things that we know, like the form factor of the G max, some of the looks of the G max, the dual extruders of the Sigma. I think that this is a decent machine. I don't think that this is a well-supported machine. I think this is not a machine for a first time user. I think this machine is built more for the tinkerer or for the person that likes to dig into the technical details of things to attempt to get working. It's like the greatest American hero's superhero suit. He just didn't have the instruction manual, so he had to figure it out. And that's what it feels like with this machine. It feels like this is a superhero super suit but it feels like I'm, I'm only given a, a page or two for the instruction manual for it. Formbot was decent with support. I can't fault them there, but having to talk back and forth to get profiles for the machine, you would think that they could put this as a download on their webpage. You would also think that using Marlin firmware, they would put the source code for their flavor of Marlin on their website, but they don't do that. And perhaps that's a GPL violation. I don't, I don't know the specifics behind there. I did email them asking for a location for the download. 
I just haven't heard back yet. So there's some price differences here. So at the time of filming, this machine base model, not like you see it here, is $1,599 US. If you add the heated bed to it, the Kinovo two-zone AC-powered heat bed jumps it to $1,799. If you add in the high-temp extruder, it jumps it to $1,875. If you add the laser engraver, $1,949. If you add the high-temp extruder and the laser all together, the total price of this, of this machine is uh, just a little north of $2,000. Is it worth it? It really depends on your technical level of expertise. I think that had I given it more time, or had I had more time, I bet I could have configured this and set this up as a workhorse, and it would have printed like a dream for thousands of hours. That's the feeling I get. I know uh, Tom, I think he goes by Filament Frenzy on Twitter. He has one of these and the prints off of his are beautiful. God bless you, Tom. I hope that people check out your Twitter and I hope that uh, people can see what's possible with this machine. But if this is going to be your first 3D printer, this is not for you. If you don't have a lot of time to tinker and you need something that can just print right away, this is not the machine for you. If you're on a budget and you can't afford $2,000 or 1599 is what the base model is, this is not the printer for you. But if you, if you have some spare Zinni coins and you're looking to tinker and you're looking to experiment and you want this, this superhero suit of a 3D printer, by all means, it's for you. And there'll be a link in the description for you to buy it. And just, just note, uh, this is not an affiliate link. I get no benefit from you buying this printer or not. And another side note, I am not keeping this machine. I don't have room for it. I think it's going to be more valuable in the community. This machine is gonna get passed on to my buddy Keith. He's gonna tinker with it. He will do some prints with it. Might throw some protopasta filaments through it. We'll see. There we go. All right, uh, well, that's the end. Thanks for watching, subscribe. Ring that bell, be awesome to each other. Uh, support me by clicking links in the description. And, and as always, high five.